Hello, I'm Professor Desabartha, and I'd like to welcome you to a unit on Greek mythology. I have a master's degree in history from the University of Central Florida, and I've been professor of history, humanities, and mythology at Seminole State College and Valencia College in Orlando, Florida. So, when we think of divinity, gods and goddesses, many times we are told that God made us in his image. But in many cases, humans make their gods in their own image. Gods tend to exist as archetypal forces in the universe for all societies. All societies have adapted gods and goddesses in very complex mythological systems. For one, gods give us a way to reference our reality and how we fit in it. And also, gods and goddesses fill in the spots of the universe when we are not really certain how things function. The philosopher Blaise Pascal once said, the universe is a really big place, but there is no God. Indeed, there are over 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone. And how many billions and billions of galaxies in the cosmos? So, deities, gods and goddesses, help us to find our place in the cosmos. God and goddess systems tend to reflect the society where they are part of. The Hebrew system, a monotheistic god, see themselves as a chosen people, an all-powerful, monotheistic, and omniscient god. That is rather unusual. Rather, in most systems, we have polytheistic systems across human society, and they often reflect, reflect certain value systems of the society in question. In Norse mythology, for example, we have gods of war, gods of battle, and bravery. For Native American mythology, their system, gods, represents harmony, the earth, cosmos. Japanese mythology gives them a source for their identity, especially uh, their cult of the emperor and his relationship to the sun goddess. Well, the system we're going to be working today is the Greek mythological system. And indeed, often for the Greek myths, we're going to see a constant soap opera play out in the realm of the gods. So, concepts of divinity. Well, the first most important thing to consider when we are referencing mythological systems are the ideas of metaphors. Now, metaphors are symbolic language that help us to understand or put together a reference point for something that we don't understand. And I will give you an example of a metaphor. For example, human beings have often been puzzled about why we have the change of seasons itself. Why do we go from having a warm summer to a cooling off period until everything turns to ice. The story I'd like to give you today to begin with concerns a very important Greek goddess by the name of Demeter. And Demeter is the grain goddess for the ancient Greeks. She turns her blessings upon the earth and the earth gives forth its crops. She is one of the most important goddesses uh, of the Greeks 
but she, and she's responsible for our food supply. But Demeter, more than anything else, loves her daughter Persephone more than anything else in this world. Now, Persephone was once out gathering flowers. Now, in Greek mythology, when you have a maiden gathering flowers, you know something bad is about to happen. And no sooner does she do, do this than the earth cracks open and the god of the underworld, Hades, uh, emerges and abducts Persephone and brings her into the underworld. Now, Demeter goes looking for her daughter, and she can't find her. And as days and weeks go by, Demeter becomes uh, morose, depressed, and miserable. And in her grief, she turns her blessings away from the earth. And the earth begins to grow colder and colder. Plants die, and the earth becomes a frozen waste. Now, Greek gods seem to depend on worship and sacrifice as part of the way they exist in a similar way that human, humans utilize food. As the world freezes, humans are not able to get the crops that they need, and they begin to turn away from the gods and goddesses, and they stop their sacrifices to these divinities. Now, the king of the Greek gods is Zeus, and we will speak much of his origin uh, and his roles in Greek mythology today. But we're just going to jump ahead. Now, Zeus is not all-knowing, like the monotheistic god of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But Zeus is very wise. And he knows what's going on. He does know that Persephone has been abducted and brought down into the underworld uh, by Hades. So... Zeus sends his messenger, Hermes, a god we'll also detail a little bit more a little bit later today, uh, and Zeus sends Hermes to the underworld to demand Persephone's release. Now, meanwhile, in the underworld, uh, Hades is with Persephone, and Persephone becomes hungry. And she tells this to Hades, and Hades offers forth a pomegranate seed, and she eats it. She says she's still hungry, so Hades offers her another pomegranate seed, which she eats. She eats a third seed before Hermes, the messenger of the gods, arrives in the underworld with the decree that Zeus, the king of the gods, has decided that Persephone must leave the underworld and come back to the upper world again. But Hades tells Hermes, wait a second, you know the rules of the underworld, and nobody that eats in the underworld can leave the underworld, at least permanently. So, the gods and goddesses are in an uproar, and they have to figure out what to do about this problem that Persephone ate food in the underworld. And eventually it is worked out that since Persephone has eaten three seeds, she must thereby spend one month for every seed that she has eaten in the underworld. So, presumably, this would, these would be the months December, January, and February, and she is finally, after this time period, released into the upper world, and she joyously goes back into her mother Demeter's arms. And the meter, happy once again, turns her blessings once again upon the earth, and the earth warms up and heats up. We have spring and summer once again. Yet every year, Persephone is going to have to go back, and during that time period, the meter is inconsolable. And this explains, at least for the ancient Greeks, the reason why we have the change of seasons and the arrival. Of winter. We would say that this is a metaphorical story. Now, if we think of uh, the great culture of the classical Greeks from around 600 to 400 BC, 
we would probably ask, did the Greeks really believe this? Did the philosophers of the ancient Greeks believe this story? Probably not. But it was still their story, and this story was special to them. Just as people, no matter where they come from, have stories that are special to them. So, one of the things I'd like to talk about today, then, uh, in this brief introduction to Greek mythology, uh, we're going to begin with the origin and creation myths of the ancient Greeks. So, Greek creation states that in the beginning of all things, there was a yawning emptiness called chaos. Now, by chaos, uh, the Greeks did not mean disorder, but simply a cosmic emptiness at the beginning of time. And eventually, forms began to emerge out of chaos. These included Eryx, which means love, Tartarus, which will be part of the underworld, which we'll explain uh, in a little bit, Erebus, which means darkness, and night. Now, Erebus and night mate with one another. Don't ask me how that's possible. Uh, and day emerges from their union. But most important, coming out of chaos, was the first conscious being, the first goddess of the ancient Greeks, and her name was Gaia. Now, Gaia is the earliest goddess that was worshipped by the ancient Greeks, and many scholars believe that she might be an archetype of what we call in mythology the great goddess. Uh, a mother goddess, usually associated in some ways with the earth, such as this uh, little statue we have coming from about 25,000 BC, that we call the Venus of Willendorf. So Gaia is the Earth Mother. Actually, the Romans called her Terra. And from Terra, we get terrain. Basically, she means Earth. But Gaia was the first conscious being in the universe. Yet she was alone and desired companionship. So she gave birth. She gave birth to a god known as Oranos. And if Gaia means earth, Oranos means sky. And from the union of Gaia and Oranos, we have the first gods and goddesses that emerged into the cosmos. And this first level of divinity we call the Titans. Now, the Titans are the first gods and goddesses that emerged. The Titans were very, very large. They were not particularly bright. And there were not very many of them that emerged at this early period in time. So they tended to pair off with their siblings and marry one another, brothers and sisters. Most important among these early titans, uh, was Kronos. And Kronos would marry his sister Rhea. But not before taking a sickle 
and overthrowing by castrating his father Oranos and taking his father's severed genitalia and throwing them into the ocean. Now, the bodily fluids of Oranos mingled with the sea foam, and emerging from that uh, became the goddess Aphrodite, goddess of love and beauty. We'll talk more about her in a little while. So Oranos has been overthrown, and Kronos is the new leader of the Titans. But just as he overthrew his father, he was told, possibly in a prophecy, or maybe a dream, that one of his children would overthrow him. So when Rhea began to give birth, Kronos began to swallow the children. And I'll write the names, we'll talk um, about these deities in some depth, uh, and I'll put those on the board at this time. So, the children of Kronos and Rhea. Hades, Poseidon, Hera, Demeter, and Hestia. Each one of them, as they are born, swallowed by their father, Kronos. One by one, the first five children of Kronos and Rhea are swallowed. Now, by the fifth child, Rhea is getting sick of this. She wanted to have some children. So when a new child is born, and his name is Zeus, Hera tricks Kronos by giving him a rock wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now Kronos doesn't even look. He just takes the rock and the bundle of clothing and swallows it whole, thinking he swallowed the new child. But Rhea takes the baby Zeus and gives him to Gaia to nurse in secret. And during this time, Zeus grows to adulthood and finally decides to make a bid for the overthrow of his father, Kronos. And the way he does this is that every night, Kronos drinks a nightly cup of wine. So Zeus poisons the wine, and Kronos drinks it that night and becomes violently ill. He becomes violently ill and begins to vomit and first he vomits up the rock. And then one by one, he vomits up the five children. And Zeus gathers his siblings, along with some new allies, creatures that have also found their way into the universe, including the Cyclopses, gigantic one-eyed monsters that actually give uh, Zeus uh, his main weapon, his lightning bolt main power. Also, uh, a group of monstrous beings called the Hundred Handers who will become the prison guards of the underworld. And a great battle then proceeds between the Titans and the new order of gods and goddesses. The Titans are overthrown and they are cast down into a fiery abyss known as Tartarus, which I'll have more to say about in just a little while. And with all the Titans overthrown, the new gods and goddesses decide to take up residence. Now, the highest mountain in Greece was Mount Olympus. And the Greeks reasoned that if their gods and goddesses lived somewhere, it would probably be on this highest of all mountains. And so from that, we get the term Olympians. So the first order of gods were the Titans, and the second order of gods are the Olympians. 
and they take up residence on Mount Olympus, but yet we have three brothers, Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon, who must decide who gets what part of the universe. And the way the three brothers decide on their place in the universe is by drawing straws, by casting lots. This was done quite often in the ancient world, especially among the Greeks, when you had to make a difficult decision. And three lots and three places in the universe. Zeus draws first, and he draws a lot of the heavens, and so he becomes the primary sky god. His brother Poseidon draws next, and Poseidon gets second best, which is the lot of the sea. The short straw went to Hades, and Hades gets the underworld, and down he goes. Down he goes into the underworld. Uh, now, we will go into some detail about the myths of the afterlife of the Greeks, but suffice it to say at this point that the Greeks made no temples to Hades, they made no statues of Hades. They basically tried to pretend that he didn't exist, because Hades represented death, and death was hateful to the Greeks. So, we have the three brothers have found their place in the universe. Uh, I will briefly introduce a couple. We'll go into a little bit more detail of, of these gods and goddesses in a little while. Uh, I, will, I will talk a little bit more about several of them, however. Hera becomes the wife of Zeus, and she is also a goddess that's associated with marriage and pregnancy as her domains in the cosmos. Demeter, we've already introduced. Demeter is the primary grain goddess of the Greeks. I would like at this time to speak of, with some detail, however, about Hestia. Now, Hestia is one of the most important of the Greek goddesses, and she's probably the one goddess that most people know very, very little about despite her importance. Hestia's place in the home of all people among the Greeks is the cooking, the hearth, or fireplace, usually with a great big kettle on it. And that was the area of the home that was sacred to Hestia. Because Hestia, as the goddess of hearth and home, Hestia brings the blessings of the food that's cooked in that fireplace, she represents good food, good drink, but also wife, husband, children, friends and family, everything that we count as part of having a good life, sacred to Hestia. She was one of the most important of the Greek divinities. So it's uh, unfortunate that she is probably the least known of the Greek gods and goddesses. So let's take a look at another very important element of Greek mythology. And this is the case of the Greek afterlife. Now myths of the afterlife are common to all human cultures. Because one of the realities of being human is that we are only here in this world for a limited time. So the Greeks, as all people, had a very complex system as to how we exist in the afterlife and how we can possibly make the best of our circumstances to try to make sure we get to the best places and have a paradise, if possible, in the afterlife. 
Now, the Greek realm of the dead is known for the god of the dead, Hades. Hades is the god of the underworld, and he is also the name of the underworld. So, we'll talk about the journey that the soul makes from life to the underworld. The journey from life to the underworld. Now, when a person died in ancient Greece, they were always buried with a coin placed within the mouth of a deceased person, or sometimes placed upon the eyes. This was very important, and you could actually get into a lot of trouble if you did not bury your dead family member properly. The separation between the world of life and the world of the dead is kind of a highway of the underworld the great river that separates the realm of life and the realm of the dead, and that is the river Styx. Now, however, in order to cross the river Styx, there is a ghostly boatman, and his name was Charon. And Charon is the general image that of the Grim Reaper, skeletal figure, often depicted with a hood upon his head. And you have to pay Charon a coin in order to cross the river Styx into the land of the dead. Now, while the Greeks were not enthusiastic to contemplate their journey to the afterlife, uh, into Hades proper. It was very important that you did make this crossing because if you were deceased, at least Hades, the land of the dead, is where you belonged and at least would be where the soul will find peace. So you need to make this crossing, whatever your fate in the underworld, because if you did not, for example, if you did not have a coin placed in your mouth and could not cross into the underworld like this, then your soul would be trapped in the world of the living. And these are ghosts. So ghosts in Greek mythology are those very unhappy spirits that were unable to make the crossing into Hades. They are trapped in our world, unable to find peace, forever unhappy, existing among us, and never finding the rest and repose that a properly buried person would enjoy. There is another being that must be crossed in the journey into Hades, and that is a gigantic three-headed dog by the name of Cerberus. Now Cerberus, the great watchdog of Hades, basically keeps the living out and the dead in. So he's kind of the, the, the watch being of, uh, of Hades, the great watchdog of the underworld. Now, there are other parts of Hades as well. But earliest among the Greeks was simply the idea that when the, the soul went down into Hades, it basically just drifted. It drifted in an afterlife that was neither particularly good nor particularly bad. You just wandered around as a gray shade for the rest of your life. Later on, however, the Greeks began to 
evolve their concept of the afterlife. And indeed, the fate I just mentioned might be the place of the masses who are neither particularly good nor particularly bad. A group that Christians might deem, a term that's used sometimes in Christianity, as the lukewarm. These souls would exist in a realm known as asphodel, and indeed, wandering around as gray shades. But there was a paradise for those few that would have the blessings of the gods, and they would exist in a paradise known as the fields of the blessed, or also the Elysian fields. Now, the Elysian fields is the paradise of the ancient Greeks. And in the Elysian fields, uh, the souls of the blessed would live in a veritable paradise. Excellent food and drink all the time, no work, beautiful places to live, friends and family, and great times for the rest of all eternity. And it was very important to the Greeks that they found, be able to find their way to the Elysian fields. So there was a mystery cult of the ancient Greeks that I'd like to speak about. Now, about 10 miles from the city of Athens in ancient Greece was a city called Eleusis. And a secret ritual society existed among the ancient Greeks. Uh, a mystery cult known as the Eleusinian Mysteries. Now, the Eleusinian Mysteries, this mystery cult of the ancient Greeks, we do not know very much about, because anybody that revealed what happened, what took place during the Eleusinian Mysteries, if you ever passed on your knowledge, if you had participated in the rituals, you would be put to death. So we have only limited knowledge of what happened in this mystery cult. Now, we do know that there were three things that had to be taken place in order to participate in the Eleusinian Mysteries. First of all, you had to be able to speak Greek fluently. It didn't have to be your uh, native language, but the Greeks classified all people as belonging to one or two cultural groups. Either you were Greek, or you were one of the people at the outskirts of Greek society. People with what the Greeks thought spoke horrible languages, that to the Greeks always sounded kind of like bar, 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 bar to the ancient Greeks. So the Greeks called them barbaroi, which is where we get the term barbarian from. So you were either a Greek or a barbarian, one or the other. And as I said, it didn't have to be your native language, but as long as you spoke Greek, you could participate in the ritual. Next, you could not be guilty of a blood crime. This means you could not have committed murder to participate in the rituals and the mysteries. This did not count if you had killed someone in battle, but uh, if you had a blood crime, uh, you would not be allowed to participate. And the third qualification, a little bit unusual, you had to pay the price of a sacrificed pig. You had to sacrifice a pig in order to uh, participate in the rituals. Why? Uh, well, um, 
not every family can afford to sacrifice a pig. Uh, a pig would give plenty of meat for a poor family for some time. So this also indicated that you came from a higher cultural standing among the ancient Greeks. And these were the qualities and qualifications for participation in the Eleusinian mysteries. Now, all we know is that something was shown to these people in the Eleusinian mysteries, and we don't really know what exactly happened. But some scholars of mythology believe that it might have been a wheat stalk. And there is some evidence to think that there might have been ritual use of bread, which was sacred to the grain goddess Demeter, and also wine, sacred to the Greek god Dionysus. Bread and wine to participate in a ritual or within a ritual. Sound familiar? It should. Indeed, the use in Christianity, especially in its early period, ritual use of bread and wine. Well, Christianity, which uh, found its beginnings in the Roman Empire and a part of the Roman Empire that was culturally Greek. And so in early Christianity, a new mystery cult, now the cult of Jesus, existed in early Christianity. Ritual use of bread and wine would not be unfamiliar to people that were culturally Greek in that part of the Roman Empire. In any event, we also believe that something was, was shown to the participants, which some scholars have theorized may have been a stalk of wheat in various phases. First a seed, then a sapling, then a growing plant, and then a fully mature plant, which was then cut, and the, the seeds shaken out of the plant. The idea of birth, growth, maturity, old age, death, and rebirth. Now, it was believed that participating in the Eleusinian Mysteries would give you a, a, maybe not a guaranteed place, but a better shot at arriving in the Elysian fields. There is a third place in the Greek underworld, however, and this was a place that all Greeks feared, and this was dreaded Tartarus. Now, Tartarus was a fiery, infernal realm. The soul that was unlucky enough to be cast into Tartarus, the pit of Tartarus, would free fall for nine days and nine nights before splatting on the bottom of Tartarus. So deep was its depths within the underworld. And Tartarus, a fiery, Fernal realm was a place those that had offended the gods in some way or another. Or people who were simply cruel, murderous, and evil would be sent to Tartarus. Now, interesting, this idea of a fiery place for the damned. Well, this also may have been part of the, the idea that early Christianity had. The idea of a blessed place, heaven, for those that had dedicated themselves to a good life, uh, a place for the damned in Tartarus, and a neutral place, somewhat like the idea of purgatory in Roman Catholicism. So I will tell you once right now a little bit about that. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Tartarus is actually mentioned in, in the uh, New Testament. It's to be found in uh, the New Testament in 2 Peter. And even Hades is mentioned twice in the book of Revelations as well. So I, I will tell you uh, the story of one being that was cast into Tartarus, and his name was Sisyphus. Now, Sisyphus was a Greek who attempted to try to outwit Hades himself. 
to outwit death itself by telling his wife to bury him without a coin in his mouth. This way, he would not descend properly over into Hades. Ultimately, Hades found out that he was being tricked by Sisyphus in this manner, and Hades was outraged. He dragged Sisyphus down into Tartarus and gave him a terrible damnation. And the punishment of Sisyphus was that every day over at a great hill, he had to roll a big boulder up the hill. Taking all day long, he would finally reach the top of the hill in agony and perspiration and watch in frustration as the rock tumbled back down the hill and down Sisyphus would go once again, pushing that rock up and down the hill for all eternity. So in any of this is the basic idea that the Greeks had of their afterlife. Let's go and talk at this time then about some of the primary gods and goddesses of the Greek system. So, among the gods of the Greeks, uh, most important and most developed was Zeus, the king of the gods. And Zeus was a sky god. He wielded the power of the lightning bolt. But Zeus, like all the Greek gods and goddesses, tended to have, well, the Greek gods tended to have weaknesses in the manner of humans. And Zeus's weakness is that he could not resist a beautiful woman. So he's the king of the heavens as well, but he is constantly having affairs with women gods and god excuse me goddesses and mortal women and whenever a greek god has sex it produces a child i'm not saying usually no it produces a child the greeks are like superhuman and they are super fertile and zeus rapidly begins to have dozens and dozens of children and as we shall see, his wife, Hera, will not be happy with this. Now, one of the things about Greek gods and goddesses that make them different from the Judeo-Christian Islamic deity, however, is the aspect of divinity for the Greeks is much different than what we have, especially in the Judeo-Christian Islamic system. For example, if you ask someone in our present day, do you believe in God? It is not a trick question. But for the Greeks, they had a different type of concept of divinity. The Greek gods and goddesses are not only a being living over on Mount Olympus, they also embody the qualities of their domain. And I can illustrate this best with our next god, Poseidon, and also with the goddess Aphrodite. Because Poseidon, who I already mentioned, was the god of the sea. And also, so he was the primary god of the sea, but also a god associated with earthquakes and horses as well. But he is not just the god of the sea, he is the domain of the sea, and he is the temperament of the sea. And just as the sea is in, unpredictable, so is Poseidon 
unpredictable, depending on his mood. You could find Poseidon, who could be the most gentle and kind of all Greek gods, but also his temper could be furious. And a boat lost in a terrible sea storm could reflect the anger qualities that we have with Poseidon. You'll notice here with Poseidon that I do have a Roman name as well. I'm not going to speak very much of this, but the Romans, a later people, adopted the religion of and mythology and the gods and goddesses of the Greeks uh, while assigning them the Roman names of gods and goddesses that already existed in the pantheon of the Romans. So every Greek deity also has a Roman name, in the case of Poseidon, it being Neptune. So let me continue then with the goddess Aphrodite in a similar manner to Poseidon. Now Aphrodite, who is the most beautiful of the Greek goddesses, she is the god, goddess of beauty and also love. And what do we mean by love? We mean sex. But she is also the domain of human sexuality as well. So if you ask a Greek, do you believe in Aphrodite? That question would be meaningless to them. Because it would sound like you're asking the Greek, do you believe in human sexuality? And, and how can you answer that question? So Aphrodite, most beautiful of the Greek goddesses, and she is the goddess also of sexual fertility. The wife of Zeus was Hera. Hera was the queen of heaven. She is the goddess also of marriage, and Greek women would seek her out during pregnancy and ask for her blessing as, as well. But as I said, Zeus is, while he's married to Hera, he is constantly having an affair with women, whether goddess or mortal, and having dozens and dozens of children. Hera cannot do anything against Zeus directly because of his power. So what Hera does is go out of her way to make the lives of the children of Zeus as miserable as possible. For example, we do have the story of Hercules. The Greek name is actually Heracles. But Hercules, who was the son of Zeus, Hera tried to make his life terrible. Ultimately, when Hercules married and had children, Hera put a madness on Hercules that caused him to murder his own wife and children in a mad range, rage, excuse me, and then go into a series of 12 terrible labors to redeem himself. If Aphrodite was the most beautiful of the Greek goddesses, the most beautiful male of the Greeks, of the Greek gods, was Apollo, the god of the sun. Now, Apollo is the god of the sun, but also the god of music, poetry, and also a god of healing. But also, interestingly enough, also a god of sudden death. For Apollo had a bow, and if you ever struck by an arrow of Apollo, you fell over instantly dead. So if a person had a sudden heart attack or stroke and fell over instantly dead, they would say that this unfortunate was struck by an arrow of Apollo. But Apollo was usually a very kind god as well. He had two primary slogans, and there are slogans that work well in our present day. One of them was, know thyself. Good consideration in our present day and now, and age. And also, nothing in excess. Also known as everything in moderation. Good food, good drink, sure. Fine, keep it in moderation. Now, Apollo also had a twin sister, and her name was Artemis. 
She was the goddess of the moon and also a goddess that was associated with young girls and also with animals, especially baby animals, likes of which, if you remember the Bambi movie with them, that we have. So, but Artemis, like all the Greek deities, could also have a furious temper. So, I will tell you a brief story about the unlucky hunter by the name of Actaeon. Now, Actaeon was a Greek hunter who was having a great time with his friends and his dogs hunting deer one day uh, in the forest. When suddenly, having separated himself from his friends, he burst into a small pond, a small clearing that had been shaded by trees. And there, bathing in the nude, was a woman who was far too beautiful to be mortal. He knew he had seen a goddess, and there was Artemis bathing in the nude. And she was furious that a mortal had observed her in this way. So she turned him into a deer, just as his friends and dogs came upon him, and not knowing that this was their comrade and friend, Acteon, he was ripped apart by his own dogs as his friends looked on, laughing, not knowing that this was their friend, Acteon. So the Greek gods and goddesses were always very powerful, but they could also have a furious temper. Dionysus was the god of wine. He may have been partially worshipped through the ritual use of wine and bread in the Eleusinian mysteries. And he also had a little bit of a mystery cult associated with himself, a cult of rebirth. Because the, the grape vines begin to grow in the spring and they flourish in the summer and finally in the fall they pick the grapes and then tar down the vines which will be reborn again in the spring. Once again, birth Maturity, death, and rebirth, a common system and belief among all peoples. The final god that I will mention is Hermes, whom the Romans called Mercury. He was the messenger of the gods, especially from Zeus. He was also God that was associated with magic and writing. And it said that also he would have some level of helping to convey souls to reach their proper place in the underworld. And there are other divinities as well among the great pantheon. But these are some of the major gods and goddesses of a very rich mythical system. And the Greek myths have been alive and well thousands of years. They continue to fascinate audiences, and there are so many references that you can go to to explore them. My recommendation is a great writer from around 800 BC, Homer, the author of possibly the two greatest texts of the ancient Greeks, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Thank you.